Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies held a development dialogue on 30th of April to discuss the economic responses to opening up the economy after the COVID-19 lockdown. I'm joined by Neva Machetla, a senior economist at TIPS, who presented at the seminar to discuss her paper. Welcome, Neva. Um, Neva, I've got some questions for you. Um, in your presentation, um, uh, you spoke about a hammer and dance approach. Can you explain the two different approaches and summarize the choices to opening up the economy? Yeah, well, the thing about the hammer and the dance, it doesn't come from me, it comes from a journalist, but I think it's also quite a common concept in epidemiology, which is that you do the lockdown, that's the hammer. It's abrupt, it's violent, it just stops things dead. And the reason you do that is actually mostly to buy time. Because when people aren't in contact, they can't spread the disease. So when you have a disease for which there's no immunity and no vaccination and no effective cure yet, you just want to stop it while you build up your resources to treat people. Hopefully come up, you probably won't come up with the vaccination in time, but you might come up with some treatments. You build up your hospital space. You know, you, you create a little bit of space so that you can handle the surge better. The dance is then to say, but we can't keep everybody locked out forever. So at some point we have to let people get on with life at some level, but it won't be the same life as before the hammer because there's now this big infectious disease out there that we can't easily stop. And it does kill people, at least some people, and makes other people feel miserable. Okay. So the argument is we need to find ways to reduce the risk of transmission. In this case, it means especially social distancing it means sanitation, um, and it means good ventilation, and some of those things that will make it harder for people to spread it to other people. And then the second part of the dance is to build up your capacity during the lockdown period so that you can screen people, you can find out who's actually got the infection, and then isolate them. So and what that is, way, mm -hmm. isolating everybody in their homes, you isolate mm -hmm. people who actually have the disease. So, so what has been the impact of the approach of taking the hammer approach on South Africa? Well, the biggest impact was that when we stopped travelers, for a while there, this, the level of new cases dropped dramatically from hundreds to tens. Yeah? It then began to creep up slowly. Um, and what's become very clear is, especially in the Western Cape, it's not, it's basically in control everywhere in the country except the Western Cape. But it's still increasing slowly. And most epidemiol epidemiological models show that we'll probably have a surge in a couple of months because what happens is in winter, everybody stays indoors and they're more likely to pass it to each other. Okay, and then the aims of the dance approach, what, what, how do we understand that? So the idea of the dance is you really, to, again, you're trying to manage risks without just shutting everything down. So it's a risk management problem. And the core to risk management, now this is something economists do think they know about. Um, the core to risk management is firstly to try and minimize the risk, then to um, monitor the outcomes of your decisions, and when things go wrong, to find ways to improve what you were doing. So in this case, what that really means is this. We need to say in terms of the economy, how do we minimize the risk? Then we can say which activities are worth it to go forward despite the risk. Then we have to monitor to make sure both the employers are implementing what they say they're going to do, but also that if there is an outbreak, we catch it quickly and we, we isolate the people so they don't then infect more people. Yeah? Now, if you look at the risk in South Africa, the one thing I would say that we tend to underestimate is it's actually relatively easy particularly obviously for individual businesses to fix their own workplaces. Public transport, because of apartheid residential patterns, public transport is, is a key vector for transmission in a country like South Africa. Yeah? Um, the other major vector, by the way, is at home. So if we can't fix public transport, which is not something individual companies can do, it doesn't help that much to say we'll minimize the risk in the production process itself. So then what are the implications for business as we open up and we move to the level four opening up? Well, the, it's more that level four as a way of managing risk. I think they took, they took a somewhat 
unnecessarily rigid approach. And that's why you get some of these decisions that can look quite arbitrary. Yeah? Um, so like the idea that you can buy heaters but not kettles. Yeah? Or the, <laughs> the idea that you can have food delivered but maybe not books. Hi. Um, you know, um, the argument behind the risk management system would be rather deal with that kind of thing by monitor. So instead of saying, for instance, what's in there now, most of manufacturing outside of the mining value chain and food and healthcare can only have a third of their staff on site. Rather say they have to come and submit plans to show how they will manage the risk. And then if that, if those plans are adequate, then we let them implement. And then you have, for instance, the existing occupational health and safety measures, which include worker employer committees to make sure that it's working and to gradually improve it. If so, you, I mean, the risk of saying that we're going to do, we're just going to say some industries may open and others may not, either because we think they're essential or because we think the risk can be managed better, is that there are companies within those things that may be highly risky. You know, there was a pharmaceuticals company that had 100 cases of COVID in one of its plants. I mean, a pharmaceuticals companies of all things, because that's an essential process. You know, and there may be things producing toys, you know, companies that can now only produce with 30% of their workforce, which may mean they can't produce at all. And they never get a chance to say, but this is how we can set up the workplace so that it would be safe for our workers. So how would government then need to react um, in terms of supporting firms and supporting the opening up of the economy in a way that's more systematic um, and different to what's been happening at the moment? Okay, so there's actually two questions there. Because part of the problem is it's not just the regulations that are stopping people from going into production. A lot of companies, so several other things get in the way. One of them is companies have been having to meet a bunch of fixed costs, often including they're paying their workers even though they're not able to produce, but also things like rent and taxes and so on. And those fixed costs go on whether or not they have any income. So their income in most cases has gone down dramatically or even disappeared but they've had to pay out of whatever cap, you know, liquid cash they have, they've had to meet those costs. So some of them are facing a huge liquidity problem. And if they don't get assistance with that liquidity, and there are some government programs to help, but it's actually quite critical that as they open up between the banks and government, they need to have access to just sufficient liquidity to open up their businesses. The second problem is a lot of these companies are in value chains. If we don't make it easy to import the inputs or to procure inputs from other producers, then it doesn't matter if they can open up, they can't produce. Right? Similarly, if they can't sell their goods because all the retail stores are closed or only able to sell very limited numbers of goods, it doesn't help to say you can open up. So outside of a few products, people are not allowed to sell through retail and they're not even allowed to sell through delivery services. So that also makes it difficult for them to open. Two other big problems is there's been crashing demand both from South African consumers because so many people have lost their jobs or incomes, but also internationally. So all companies are going to face low demand. And once we really start opening up the economy, that's when we really need a stimulus package to address that domestically and regionally. And then finally, the most, the, you know, two thirds of workers in South Africa are employed in services and retail. Those are actually, Businesses that have customers on site are the hardest to open up safely. And it's quite clear that a lot of entertainment, restaurants, things like that, personal services also like hairdressing and so on, will be the last to open up. And we need some way to build in protection for those workers. You know, we live in one of the most unequal societies in the world. And if we don't find a way to say those workers also need to have protection, even for the next six months in the case of tourism, possibly two years before you see a recovery you know, we will have real trouble on our hands. Do we understand yet what the implications are on jobs or um, I suppose at this stage, is it just hypothetical? It's not entirely hypothetical. We don't have proper data. We won't have proper data till June because the surveys were delayed precisely because of the pandemic. What we know is this, close to 2 million workers, their employers have applied to the UIF. So that's about 25% of the formal sector. And many employers, even though they could apply, they haven't or they haven't managed to register properly. 
The other thing we know is that travel to work is down by around 50%. So Google Maps does a thing where they check whether people are traveling to workplaces. And the number of people traveling to work is down by 50%. So that would suggest that at least half of people aren't going to work. Now, some of them may be working from home. But actually, only about 10% of formal workers are able to work from home. Because really, if you're not a professional or a manager, it's not something you can do easily. So that would suggest that the job losses could be between 25 and even up to 50%. And I understand the Reserve Bank says, uh, the Reserve Bank or Treasury has estimated we're going to have formal unemployment up to 50% when we finally get the records. Okay, thank you very much, um, Neva. Um, I think that comes to the end of our interview. Um, and on that gloomy note. <laughs> yes, on that gloomy note. Um, thank you very much.